Today, I'm so happy to introduce you all to what we're calling the San Antonio Connection. Um, we have three great candidates out of San Antonio area and um, that we're so happy to introduce you to all of them. Um, first is Roland Gutierrez is a senator from Senate District 19, which includes parts of San Antonio and the south and west areas of San Antonio that include Del Rio and Uvalde. He fights for a good, good paying jobs, funding for the schools and an economy that works for Texas families. And you may have seen a lot of him recently in the last few months because he's really been doing the hard work and fighting for the Uvalde families after the Uvalde massacre. So you will know him from that. Becca DeFelice is running for House District 21, or 121, sorry. House District 121, which includes North Central San Antonio up to Stone Oak and beyond. She is a mom, community safety advocate, and a leader who believes in the Texas that the Texas led should work for everyone and not just special interests. So thank you so much, Becca. We're so glad you're here. I know Becca from also from her work with Moms Demand, and she is also um, a great advocate for, for gun safety, along with I think everybody here who is on this panel tonight is an advocate for gun safety laws. So I'm really proud about that. Um, Angie, Air, okay. Arama Buru, did I say that right? I don't know. Aram Buru. Uh -huh. Okay, I was very close. Aram Buru is running. Right. Okay, is running for House District 122, which includes Northwest San Antonio. And um, okay, I don't know how to say this other word. This other okay. Um, Helotes, is that correct? Helotes, uh huh. Okay, Helotis. fantastic. Including Helotes Medical Center area. She is a mom, a community leader, and a small business owner. She is running because the current leadership is no longer working for Texas families. So, welcome, Roland, Becca, and Angie. We're so happy that you are here. I'm going to let each of you all talk about important important things about your district. If you could just limit it to um, three minutes for each of you to talk about the important issues in your district and why you are running. So let's start with Becca. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on today. And I'm so excited to be talking to everybody. So my name is Becca moyer Defoli. I'm running in House District 121. It is a reliably moderate district where the incumbent took a super hard turn to the right. And frankly, I know that the values of our district are not being represented. And so I'm just so pleased that I was able to run in this cycle. Um, I'm particularly excited that Roland is on today as well. We got to work together a little bit in the last session and actually got a good bill passed that is providing mental health care for rural Texans. Something that that policy pay that for me, that's what's most important. That we have leaders in the legislature who understand that the policy that it, we are working on is meant to be for Texans that is inflicted on Texans. So ultimately, we are one of the top seats to win this November. And so any support or um, encouragement that we can get from you all would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Angie? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Angie Aramburu, and I am so happy to be here because I signed up and joined Mothers Against Greg Abbott right in the very beginning. I was so upset about the lack of mask mandates in schools, and I was reaching out to every group one that I was so happy he existed and was so proud to join. So I'm really happy to be here tonight. And actually, that was part of the reason I decided to run. So I'm a small business owner. Um, I am a mom to three kids in elementary and middle school. And public service has always been a big part of my life. Um, I have 25 years experience in public relations and nonprofit management. So I've always tried to combine my career with public service. So running for office is an extension of that desire to serve the community. And I have to say the last few years were just very frustrating for me. I got tired of living in Greg Abbott's Texas. I found myself every day saying, how are, are they going to try and kill us today? Between the permitless carry laws that made 
everywhere more dangerous, um, the horrific response to COVID, and now the draconian abortion ban that's putting the lives of women and girls at risk. And so I tried every avenue in terms of reaching out to leaders, going on the media, joining groups like this. And I just decided that the best way to get something done was to try and do it myself. And so here I am, and that's how I ended up running for office. Um, and uh, fortunately, I suppose our um, current representative is retiring. He's a very popular, moderate Republican who has voted with Democrats quite often, fought against Greg Abbott quite often, although he did vote for the abortion ban. Um, but what I'm seeing is our district has voted for a very moderate person for 12 years. And so I think that gives us a nice window of opportunity because my opponent is the most extreme right you will find. He um, chairs the school choice committee, is pro-voucher. He was part of a group that sued to allow people with restraining orders to bear arms. So you're not going to find anyone more extreme than this guy. So um, that gives me extra energy every day to try and win this race um, because we cannot let people like that make the rules that affect our lives every single day. Um, so again, I'm running for House District 122 in North San Antonio. As Becca mentioned, if there's anything you'd like to do to help in this race, we would certainly appreciate it. Volunteering, contributing, um, or just following us and sharing our social is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Roland, you're up next. Well, thank you so much. Um, certainly appreciate all of your efforts going forward. I, I apologize. I was actually driving back from Austin right now. So I apologize for uh, being on my phone doing this. I promise I've now pulled over uh, to, to speak to you all. It has been, uh, you know, I've been in public office now for going on 16 years. Uh, most of that time spent in the House of Representatives prior to that city council uh, in San Antonio and now been in the Senate after one full term running for my second term. The issues that the Mothers Against Greg Abbott are talking about are issues that affect every Texan day in and day out. We deserve so much better than what we have gotten from this administration. Uh, from Dan Patrick, from Paxton, and everybody out there on the other side of the aisle. Because the reality is that we are living in a world in, in Texas where the issues have become more about attacking us, you know, doing what's right for Texans, actually providing mental health care. Uh, I'll tell you, we're dead last in mental health care funding in the, in the United States, actually providing education in a, in a proper way. We're 44th in education performance. We're almost 44th in spending across the United States. We can do better for our kids. We have a governor that refuses to do uh, what we term Medicaid expansion. For those of you that aren't aware exactly fully what that means, it's not health care for poor people. It is health care for working class Texans uh, at 125% of poverty level, people that are working, that can't afford health care on their own. This governor has refused session after session from accepting that money. It's a nine to one match, which by the way, is our own money as well. Let's go ahead and just go to the next question and we'll start from there. So um, there is like all three of you guys have said there is a lot going on in Texas right now. It just seems like the entire state is on fire. It just seems like it's burning down. There is one issue after another issue after another issue. I've been living in Austin since 1995 and I've never experienced an administration that is actively seeking to hurt other Texans like this administration is. It just, it, it's stunning to me um, as a Texan to be living here during this time and just see how, how it's now our everyday families and our everyday communities, how they're being hurt 
by the current administration. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, about where where we stand on education and what our platforms are on education and how what we can do to protect public education here in Texas. So we'll start with Becca. We all know that public education is literally the foundation of our democracy, making sure that our kids are growing up informed with critical thinking skills and the ability to move forward into either a career or college, whatever they choose to do. That's something that is constitutionally protected in Texas. But what we're seeing is that this administration is refusing to invest in our public schools. Our teachers are 38th in the nation for pay and 50th for benefits. Our retired teachers have not seen a cost of living adjustment since 2004. The average retired teacher is receiving $1,800 a month, which frankly, if you have ever tried to stretch $1,800 to cover your property taxes and your groceries and your utilities, you are just scraping by. Never mind if you have a car payment, you're done. So what is what our first priority should be is making sure that our schools are fully funded and that the state is paying its fair share so that we are not paying increasingly higher property taxes, but we are increasing people so that we can have counselors in schools. We can have that added layer of emotional and social well-being for our students. And frankly, we need to stop the culture wars in our schools. It is detrimental to every Texan have the small skirmishes being fought in our public school systems. Thank you. Okay, Andy, your turn. So I'll echo a lot of what Becca said. We need to fully fund our schools. We have a teacher attrition right now. We cannot fill positions in our schools. Um, And it's not just the pay. It's the, like she said, the culture wars going on inside the classroom. It's the banned books. It's threatening teachers with litigation for simply teaching their subject. Um, It's too much. And, And in addition, the state keeps putting additional mandates on teachers and mandates on schools without removing any of the previous mandates. So they just keep building on one another. Nobody ever goes back to see if some of these are outdated, if they are still necessary, if one supplants the other, it just keeps adding up. And so teachers end up working after school, before school, and just have constantly more on their plate with less pay. They're not getting a pay increase. It's actually a pay decrease when you want inflation. They're making less than they did 10 years ago. Um, And it comes down to a lack of respect. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, we gave our teachers a certain respect, the children, the students, and the parents. And now I know a big part of teaching is dealing with parents who are questioning teachers' motives, they're questioning their tactics. And we have to go back to respecting teachers and making sure we're attracting the best and brightest. and going back to funding. So what the state has been doing is they set a budget and, and then the schools have to work within that. And I think that's backwards. I think we should start by asking the schools, what is it that you need to be successful? What do you actually need? What will that cost? Let's start there when building the budget. We shouldn't be saying this is how much we have work with it because clearly that is not working for our schools. Um, so I think more funding and just more reasonable funding based on actual need would go a long way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roland. I think that people ask themselves this question about, you know, what, what, how we're funding education. You have to talk about priorities. We have a governor that in his tenure has spent over $12 billion on what something he calls Operation Lone Star. It is a failed border operation that is nothing more than gimmicks, stunts, and quite frankly, stunts that have cost this state more money with no metrics whatsoever on curtailing immigration flow into the United States. If anything, 
the statistics will show you that the 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 amount he spent really a paltry sum when you look at federal spend, federal spending in this area has done nothing to stop the flow of immigration but that 12 billion dollars means a substantial amount to our children and so it really is about priorities it really is about spending the money that we're supposed to spend on state government or state functions like education, rather than chasing down this mirage that only, in his mind, thinks it makes him look good in his primary, in a presidential run down the road. Well, let's be very clear. Greg Abbott's not going to get beyond this gubernatorial run because we're going to take him out. But the reality is this. The priorities of the Republican Party are misguided, and they're there to scare our populace into funding things that don't make sense. And they're doing nothing to encourage child development, increase our workforce. Over the last 40 years, Austin from the capital would spend 60% of education came from Austin and 40% from your local school property taxes. All of it was our money at the end of the day. But 60% came from the centralized, from, from all itself. And the local tax or the local tax or, uh, component of it was 40%. It is now switched 60, 40 in the other direction. And all of that expense and all of the unfunded mandates that Becky spoke about have to do with, have to do with their failed priorities and their attempts to go out to, to chasing after their Republican rainbows and not focusing on our children not focusing on the things that we need most. Certainly, you know, we're in a state now that we're going to be talking about these cultural wars. You see the book burning that's happening in Florida. It's going to happen here. What Ryan DeSantis does, Greg Abbott is his mini-me. He has to do as well. And so we really have to focus on what's happening. We deserve better in Texas. And you don't have to be a partisan to understand that our kids deserve better that Republican kids deserve better or their parents that are Republicans. All kids deserve better than what they've gotten. In. Yeah, 100 percent. Amen. I hear you there. Um, I'm very concerned about as a parent, just the funding and how how they're positioning it as, um, you know, with the with the, with the parent parental choice and that sort of thing. It's very worrisome on how they're trying to sell it to the far right. And they just been pounding vouchers, vouchers, vouchers and parental choice so much that I actually started to see it trending recently on some documents where it's finally, it seems to be a little bit more popular right now than it even it was. A, that's concerning. Let me just add this. Let me just add this on vouchers. I don't mean to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. That does nothing for rural Texans. So if you live in rural Texas, there's not a voucher in the world that's going to help you. Absolutely. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to save Friday Night Lights. It's not going to save their communities. It's only going to further destroy the, the areas and the communities, especially when it's the number one employer. So I'm very concerned about, about the positioning on vouchers for sure, especially in rural Texas. All right. Um, you don't mind. Um, while we're on the subject of vouchers, I just wanted to chime in because my opponent chaired the school choice committee. So his goal is to get vouchers passed. And I was actually watching a video where he was speaking and he said the problem is rural Republicans. They're afraid of will defund their schools. So we have to build a better mousetrap. And that was talking about his fellow Republicans. So this is who we're dealing with. But they know it's going to defund the schools. They know that what they want to do is privatize public education. So mm -hmm. all, all that that does is help the wealthy send their kids to private school because it's not enough money. That voucher is not enough money for mm -hmm. middle class, lower class to attend a private school. It just subsidizes the wealthy. And that is what they're trying to do. They're trying to turn it into a money making machine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's pivot from kids right now and let's talk about the other big issue that's happening right now in Texas. We're seeing a lot of anger stem from this. We're seeing this huge increase in women that are now registering to vote. So God bless them. I hope they all actually turn up to the polls. But the reason and the cause that we're seeing them turn out to vote is because of SBA and it's because of the Dobbs decision. And we're seeing this trending, not just here in Texas, but nationally 
that women are turning out finally. Maybe they've woken up now that they've lost some of their own personal freedoms and rights. But I wanted to get your positions on on um, a woman's right to choose and what your positions are on SBA and Dobbs and how we can move forward this fall um, if you are elected into office. So let's start with Becca. So this is a near and dear to my heart issue. And as a woman in Texas, as the mother of a 12-year-old daughter, the abortion bans that were passed in the state were the most extreme bans in the nation. They are cruel. They are destructive to women in this state. And the incumbent in my seat was a co-sponsor of SB8, the sick week ban. Not only was he a co-sponsor this year, he was a co-sponsor two years ago when there were only six co-sponsors in the House. He sat on the Public Health Committee and passed all of these bans out of committee. We need to talk about the trigger ban, and we need to talk about how it endangers our physicians in the state. It puts a $100,000 bounty on them. It puts them at risk of felony charges, imprisonment, and losing their medical license. And we need to talk about the fact that in this state, over half the counties do not have an OBGYN in residence. We have 35 counties with no physician at all. And now we are making it hostile to physicians to practice in this state. What we're saying, essentially, is that by not providing appropriate, age-appropriate sex ed in schools by limiting access to reproductive health care, and then by banning abortion. We are telling women in rural areas, we are telling women who cannot afford to cross state lines that they are disposable. We are saying that this state is saying, we don't care about you, your success, your ability to thrive. And frankly, that is just wrong. My final thought on this is one that literally keeps me up at night. When SB4 was heard in August, it was the ban on mailing medical abortion pills. And there is a specific amendment that was raised to allow child victims of assault to access that medication. The incumbent in my seat Vote to first children as young as 10, 11 to carry pregnancies to term, to not give them access. And honestly, having a child that day in my house, there is no mother in this state that cannot feel how incredibly cruel that bill is. Yeah, 100%. I I agree with you there. Um, be on the lookout for our next ad. We decided that we we're going to go there to, to something very similar to that. We just decided we we're going to uh, to talk about it and make it as shocking as possible. So that's our goal. Um, Angie, you're up next. Um, yeah, so it. it it's a very personal issue for me. I have friends, I have family that have needed abortions for various reasons and all are valid. Um, and I too have daughters that are ages 11 and 13. And so it really, really affects me emotionally to think about it because it's a fundamental human right to determine when and how you reproduce. It is such a fundamental life choice that they have taken away. And it doesn't escape me that it affects women, you know, and they're using us as political pawns for this extreme sensational topic because it gets them votes, it gets them donors, and they say they're pro-life, yet they're endangering the lives of women and girls. And let's be clear, the age of consent in Texas is 17. There's a three-year difference, I think, if the 
other party is within three years, but 14 is the limit, like 14. So anyone 14 or younger, it's rape, no matter what it is rape. And they're saying that you've been traumatized and yet we are going to re-traumatize you and they don't care. And I think that is the biggest message we get from this legislation is they truly do not care about women and girls. And so I, like you, hope that every eligible voter signs up and they make it to the polls to let them know that that is not okay. It's not okay to use us in this way and to tell us we don't matter. So obviously the first thing I would do, we need to get a majority in the house. We need to get a democratic majority and we need to get rid of this horrific legislation. Absolutely. Roland, you're up next. I'm sorry. Let me, really from a father's perspective, I have two daughters and under no certain session after session, these people have come at us with the most crazy pieces of legislation that we fought back. And unfortunately, uh, these folks have constantly, because they are in power, have been managed to, to push through legislation that at times have, they've lost at the courthouse. Unfortunately, with the Dobbs decision, we're just not there and we're in a different time now. Um, I can only say this, that these Republican men that like to make, and a few women, that like to make these decisions that affect women under no certain terms can we live like this anymore. I have been 100% pro-choice throughout my tenure in office, but we have to continue to fight and push back against these people because, you know, I think it was Greg Abbott the other day who got up there and said, well, listen, uh, if you, if you, if you get raped, there's always plan B. Well, I'm sure that that's next for them. I'm sure that that's the next thing that they're going to go after. And it sounds an awful lot like Clayton Williams when, he, when uh, Ann Richards was running and they were in a debate. And he says, listen, if, if you're women, if you're getting raped, you might as well just sit back and enjoy the ride. That's the kind of callousness that we hear from a man like Greg Abbott. He doesn't care about women. He doesn't care about the issues that face women day to day. Um, women that that have been subject to rape or incest, and even beyond that. It's just the, the very notion that we are imposing ourselves on the decisions, the health decisions of a woman is simply just wrong. Um, it sometimes seems like we're living in, in 1922 in Texas rather than 2022. We've got a long road to hope, hoe here, but the only thing that we can do is vote. We have to vote these people out of here. I'm going to tell you, this: there's a magic number here. 54%, that was the vote uh, ratio, women to men in the last midterm, 54% women. If we increase that to 56%, you will see a different outcome in this election. Beto O'Rourke will be our next governor. So women need to get very, this, this election, I don't believe the polls, this election is very close. We need to get more women angry. We need to get them mad because What's happening, we need to get them mad as hell because it's only going to get worse with these people in power. I promise you that. I've been there for six, seven sessions now, and I've seen these people and how they act. And instead of doing anything that's better in this space, it only will get worse. I promise you. Yeah, I have to admit, I never thought that anything would be worse than the session where Tom DeLay walked around and tried to negotiate everybody to do his bidding. That session, I thought, was the worst, and I was never going to see anything worse. But what has happened is that the more bored the Republicans get, the worse they get, because they get so bored, they're just, they just sit around and create more policies that are more abhorrent than the, the ones they did the session before. And it's stunning to me. As someone who just closely watches the ledge every single time they're in session and sees the bills coming out and actually reads the bills, I am just, I'm constantly surprised by the level of cruelty that, that I'm seeing, which is, it, it just, it's stunning. And, and there is a special place in hell for some of those Republican women that go and support some of these, these rules as well, especially the ones that are doctors. I'm talking about the person in New Braunfels. 
people talking about her. Um, yeah, there's there's got to be a special place in health for her to be a doctor and then and then not take the side of women like she should be doing. So it is pretty stunning. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in Texas. Like tonight we see we're seeing a hurricane hit uh, the state of Florida and we've seen hurricanes hit the state of Texas as well before. Um, and recently in Houston, well, let's talk a little bit about climate change and what impact climate change is going to have on Texas, because it's very, I think it's a really critical time right now. We need to be thinking about climate change. And I don't see enough people currently that are in elected office that are worried about it. And um, and I think the time to worry about it is is now and especially this election. So, Becca, would you like to start with climate change? Sure. I think that as we see the effects of climate change of humans affecting our environment, because we need to be honest, it is a man-made disaster. Um, we need, I, for me, we need to be concerned about water in this state. We are going to have longer, drier, hotter summers. And water is a precious resource here. We need to start investing in the infrastructure to ensure that we are providing enough water for our metropolitan areas without negatively affecting the rural areas. Because that's something that we have seen before where an urban area is taking water from a aquifer that is in a rural area. And then it negatively affects the farmers and ranchers there because they're forced to dig a new well because the water table has dropped. That's something that we have to think about. It is an unintended consequence, certainly. But as we move forward, we need to look into desalination plants. We need to start talking about how we can better conserve water. And we need to have these frank conversations about what are we doing as humans to offset the negative impact that we've had on the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Angie, you're up next. Um, yeah, this is a huge issue. And as we can see, it affects us already every single year. Um, and I think there's several things we can do concerning water, which is a huge issue, particularly in my district. Um, right now, there's a development being built. Uh, it's 2,900 homes over the aquifer recharge zone. And they just applied to uh, send over a million gallons a day of treated waste into a local creek. And that creek joins up with two others and goes directly back into our aquifer. And this is, there have been several bills introduced to prevent the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to authorize that type of discharge. And none of them have ever come up for a vote. It is time we pass sensible legislation, regulation of development to protect our precious resource of water, which is going to be more and more scarce in the coming years as it gets hotter and hotter. And we also need to build with climate change in mind. We need to have walkable cities. We need to invest in public transportation. Um, and as Becca mentioned, we need to look at desalination. Uh, we need to look at all of the options on the table because it's going to be here before we know it. It's here. And we need to start thinking about 10, 20 years down the road now before it's too late. Awesome. Thank you so much. Roland? Yeah, I think it was 2011. Don't quote me on the year, but we created a constitutional amendment that voters voted for that essentially took uh, money from our rainy day and created a formula where we would fund an amount of money towards our water development board. And that money is invested so it could provide money for water projects across the state. The fact is what we've done is uh, it's a good thing that we did that. The real problem, however, is that it essentially it's become the state offering a loan program community that are building a water project. We need to do more than that. We need to do programs that are actually grant related, where the state is actually an investor in these projects, not just building or the local reservoir. The fact is we haven't had a reservoir in Texas uh, in many, many years. We've got a new one that's coming online up in the in the in the Fort Worth area. It took that that reservoir over 34 years to get approved. 
we have to figure out the water problem going forward. And we absolutely have to do something better on emissions. Uh, when you're talking global warming, it's an emissions problem. Um, we're never going to get there on the emission side with leaders that believe that the only answer to everything is oil and gas. Listen, we are the largest producer of oil and gas, uh, one of the two in the nation. And it is always going to be part of what we do. But we have to get a little bit better about what kind of um, projects we're going to do in the future, how we're going to be able to capture carbon in a better way in the oil field so that we're conserving those jobs, but at the same time bringing in new technologies and incentivizing companies that are doing those types of projects, such as carbon capture, in a right and responsible way. Um, we have a long way to go in this space, but we're not going to get there with the leaders that we have in place right now because they're very short-sighted and they have tunnel vision about the, about one thing. And we're just not doing it right. We're not doing it well. I agree. It'd be great to, um, to elect leaders who have a vision for our energy future and that including climate change and what that means to Texas. It's one of the most frustrating things for me. I think way back when George W. Bush was in office, we saw an uptick of wind and solar. And I thought, oh, well, this is awesome because Texas is looking ahead. And even when Rick Perry took over, he was kind of promoting solar and wind as well. So I thought, okay, we might be okay. We're looking ahead. We're diversifying. This is good. But now we have Greg Abbott and all of his cronies. And even though we still have wind and we still have solar, he's he's turned those industries into the enemy. And I don't, I don't really like that. I just don't like his vision of of for climate change and his vision for Texas energy. And then the realization that we cannot sell this energy to other areas of the country, I think is a real loss to Texas because we can well, even be a lot richer right now than we are if we were able to diversify that and sell it to other states. Yeah. Well, if you just look at the energy perspective and I don't want to jump in on, you might have be having this as a subsequent question, but if you look at the energy piece and you look at what we're paying across the state on energy now, as opposed to what we paid prior to winter storm URI, Winter storm Uri and its economic consequences, never mind the death piece was horrendous. You know, 200 people don't die in a winter storm in New York or North Dakota. It just doesn't happen. That happened here in Texas. And some would argue that it was 800 people. But if you look, if you look at the economic cost on top of that, that is a direct, a direct uh, cause of Greg Abbott's solutions to what happened with that winter storm and the economic cost that we're facing now in certain communities across the street has tripled your energy bill. Absolutely. The Abbott tax, as we call it, right? Because that's really what he's done. He's increased all of our bills because of decisions that the Texas GOP and Greg Abbott made. And it, it needs to, we need to talk about it more. It needs to come up more because, because it's true. He's costing us a lot of extra money. So I think that's a really great point. Um, so uh, let, let's move on. Let's talk about um, gerrymandering and just getting voter suppression and gerrymandering. Um, I have to say it's one of those topics that depresses me recently quite a bit. Um, the topic that makes me feel very hopeful is that there's a lot of there's a lot more people coming of eight voting age. You know, we're going to be blue very soon. I feel confident about that. It's going to happen very soon. Hopefully this this next election. But um, Texas is gerrymandered to just in such terrible way that it makes it almost impossible for Democrats to get ahead. So I wanted to talk to you all about what you think about gerrymandering and voter suppression and what how does this impact your districts? So, Becca. So redistricting was an adventure for all of us to witness. Um, in my district, we only saw a four-point swing, but we saw a very significant number of changes in how the district was shaped. Um, we have a very small school district in 121. It's Alamo Heights. They're about 
4,700 students. And now those 4,700 students, their homes and households are in three different house districts. There was a reliable Democratic neighborhood that now is mysteriously in a reliably Democratic house district. And it was just neatly cut out. So all of this is done to discourage us from voting, right? HB6, the voter suppression bill, made it harder for senior Texans and disabled Texans to vote by mail. While other states are making it easier to register and vote, we are making it harder. And on top of that, I mean, just the whole session, and we've talked about this, it's like standing in the ocean and asking the waves to stop. It was one thing after another. And all of this is designed to make it so that Democrats don't turn out to vote. So that we look at it and we say, it's hopeless. We're gerrymandered. We have so we made it hard. He's going to tell. We don't have a chance. And the reality is 48% of this state voted for Biden. If we had districting that was fair, we would have a much closer makeup of both our Senate and our House. We do not. But where there is opportunity, we can win this year. And so we are asking y'all to just have hope for just hold on to that because it's easy to say it's hopeless. It's hard to have hope, but we are asking you to do the hard thing because we love this state enough to put our lives on pause, to fight for it. And we know that you do too. Thank you. Thank you. I did need to hear that. That that is really good. I was I was excited today when I opened up Twitter and I saw that Gavin Newsom made an announcement about voter voting in in California. And so he signed bills that increased the number of ballot drop offs. He um, signed bills that prevented harassment of election officials. Um, my daughter is going to be volunteering and working at the election this year. She's 16 and she can do that as a student poll worker. And all of a sudden, I'm getting really nervous about her volunteering. Like, should I have her volunteer? Should I not have her volunteer? So I think that there's a lot like we could we could do to protect our, our election poll workers. And I'm not seeing that rhetoric coming from the Republicans. So it feels good that we can elect people like you all to to get past some of the same bills that they're be, they're passing in California so we can do good things for for just elections and to get out the vote. So, Angie, it is your turn. Um, thank you. So my district, I think they were, I'm hoping they were a little overconfident <laughs> and thinking um, how red it already is. Ours only shifted about a half percent in the Republicans' favor, of course. You know, they they carved out some key neighborhoods to uh, make sure it stayed red. But I think we have the opportunity to prove them wrong, and I'm excited to try and do that. Um and what's happening with this redistricting, the gerrymandering, is they're trying to pick their voters instead of allowing the voters to pick their representatives. And it is just wrong. It doesn't allow for the majority to voice their opinion. And that is what they're stifling. And so essentially they're stifling democracy. And so something has to be done about the unfair redistricting. Um, and it needs to be done just slowly. Um, and I can talk to how lone Democrats feel. I've been block walking quite a bit. And the other day, a good example of that is we knocked on a door and it was a gentleman. He had an accent. And he said, oh, I can't vote. Yeah, I'm not a citizen. And I was like, well, that's weird because I have your name and van as a registered voter. But we walked down the street. He chased us down the street and he said, wait, wait, I'm just afraid all my neighbors are Republican and I didn't want them to know. He's like, I'm registered. My wife's registered. We moved here from Germany. Germany a year ago, and we we're gonna vote straight blue all the way down the ballot. And he was so excited that he was. I ended up talking to him about volunteering and running for office. I mean, he was very excited. But what I keep hearing over and over at these doors is everyone feels alone. And so I think the 
strongest thing we can do is let people know we're out there. You are not alone. There are lots of us. We aren't as loud. We don't have awful flags and banners. We're not in a cult. So we don't promote ourselves that way, but we are out there. We are reasonable. We just want to keep our community safe. We want equal opportunity for everyone. And we are out there. Um, and speaking of election uh, workers, we are in great need. So if you are available and interested, please sign up to be a poll worker, because if we don't have you there, the Republicans certainly they will have their people there. So we need to be have fair people representing us at the polls. Great. Thank you so much. Roland, I'm going to let you talk about this. And then I, and then I'm going to ask you if you would kick off um, the gun issue, because you have a lot of experience in Uvalde. And I definitely want to hear what you have to say about guns and Uvalde and things that are happening there. So it is now in your court, Roland. Thank you. Yeah, I'll try to keep this brief. Look, the voter suppression bills are exactly that. They're about suppressing your vote. They have not for any voter things. Susan Reed, a Republican DA in San Antonio, uh, when she was DA many years ago, found no cases of voter fraud when all of this was, was beginning to, to come up in the Republican Party. Uh, the facts are, that we need independent redistricting panels. We need to take it out of the legislative process. Many states have that. I think it's something that the state should certainly do. They are they continue to eliminate communities of interest, communities of color, uh, and diminish them. They do something called cracking and packing. Uh, in many instances, they'll put communities together so that that community is going to be minority and that community is going to be largely blue. And they're going to put uh, communities that they think are going to be largely Republican in a separate district. Uh, all of that's wrong. You can look at what's happened to Beverly Powell up in the Fort Worth, Dallas area and see specifically how they got rid of a seat that was a democratically drawn seat. But more importantly, it was a seat that brought communities of interest, minorities of color, communities of color, and, and, and created a seat for them. Voting Rights Act specifically protected them. And unfortunately, these Republicans, uh, in my opinion, have violated the Voting Rights Act in their effort. As to the gun uh, issue, it's something that uh, I can tell you I've had a summer like no other. Uh, I've stopped crying. Um, probably more angry now than anything. Um, the common denominator in all of this is guns. And so we have so much to talk about in this space because we've seen a failed law enforcement response, which, by the way, is a management piece. It's a neglect piece. We saw a story just recently that came out where uh, the radios weren't working in the school. You all know that. Well, Greg Abbott was asked in 2015 for five million dollars by this community and others surrounding it to fix their radios. He denied that request. In 2018, they asked him for $9 million, gave him a $1 million Band-Aid. The radios did not work. This radio problem is a problem all across the border. While this guy has spent money and, and like a drunken sailor on Operation Lone Star, he's failed and he's neglected the communities that needed the most valuable like radios, which, by the way, the Department of Public Safety uses more than anybody. But we... I don't want to get too much distracted in that space. You should know it because it's a management piece and the guy at the top has failed to manage and he's failed to lead just like he failed us on the winter storm. You should know it, but he's also failed us on guns. The families in Uvalde, they're, they're, they're South Texans. They hunt, they fish, they get it. They're not asking for a weapons ban. They're asking for a nominal increase of 18 to 21 so that a young man or a young woman wouldn't have a militarized weaponry like this kid had. And Greg Abbott can't even do that. He can't even do the most minimal of things for these people. That's the state of affairs that we're living now in Texas, where a young man can go buy an AR-15, because you have to be 21 to buy a handgun, you see. But you can be an 18-year-old and buy an AR-15. You can get an AR-15 easier than I can go into this convenience store in front of me and, pack, and get a, that an 18-year-old can get a beer, a pack of cigarettes. 
That's where we are. And he has refused to act. He will not call a special session. He will not do what's right for these people. And so we've got a lot of work to do here. Um, we can certainly do better. We've got to keep working to, to get some responsible gun laws. There's so many things that we can be talking about, extreme risk protective orders, age limit increases, uh, closing the weapons loophole, so many different things. But this man has refused. He has, it took him 77 days to finally talk to those families, to go there for the first time. When he was asked immediately, do you even remember, do you even know any names? He couldn't name one child, not one. He couldn't even name the child of the people he was talking to. That's your governor. We need to do better than this man, for sure. Absolutely. 100%. We, we do. It does bother me that he didn't go to a single funeral, doesn't remember a single name of any of the victims. And the level of disrespect that he has shown the families in Uvalde has just been shocking. Honestly, shocking. Um, we would not allow for this behavior to come from a president and we should not allow it to come from a governor in my humble opinion. Um, Becca, you have a lot of experience with Mama's Demand. I know you have very strong experience here. With, um, it is your turn, you are up next. So I think it's really important to note that the majority of Texans support stronger gun laws. We have the loudest, most extreme voices in the room screaming in the ears of the lawmakers. And they are following the lead of those loud, extreme voices instead of the communities that they are supposed to represent. So when Uvalde happened, my daughter was almost done the school year. She had, I think, two days left. And she looked me in the eye that night because we were a little extra huggy, you know, it, like all the parents I think in the state were. And she looked at me and she was like, mom, what is your deal? You know, like, and I just said, you know, I just really, I just really want to show you how much I love you. I care about you. I am so grateful that I got you home today. And she was like, mom, I know that you're worried about this but you don't need to worry because we practice for it all the time. And when it happens, I'll know what to do. The fact that my then 11 year old said when and not if there's nothing that makes me angrier than knowing that the people who sit in office in Austin, the Republicans there know better. And they have chosen to make it more dangerous for our families. They could pass legislation to prevent the open carry of long arms in public places. Right now, it's not even licensed. They could increase the age. They could enact extreme risk protective orders. And once Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick even flirted with passing extreme risk protective orders until he got swift pushback and then backed off of it. I mean, we know that they are aware of the, st the statistics that gun violence has risen 10% year over year in Texas for at least the last six years. But instead of making it safer for us, they have passed open carry, campus carry, unlimited armed school employees in public schools, allowing guns to be stored in cars on school parking lots. We are at the point where we now have permitless carry. All of these laws have made it more dangerous. And all of those laws say, we don't care that your children are going to school expecting that one day they will be shot in the classroom. That is unacceptable. Yeah, 100%. I hear you there. Angie, it's your turn. Um, so as a mom as well, um, I can say every day that I say bye to my kids as my girls as they walk to middle school, my son as I drop him off at elementary school, every single day. 
it crosses my mind, this could be the last time I see them. And I know I'm not the only parent that feels that way. And we do not have to feel that way. I think this is yet another example of our governor and the GOP showing us who they are, who they care about, and it's not us. It's the NRA, it's their big donors, it's the people that line their pockets. It is not us, it is not our kids. We clearly know who these school shooters are. They've identified, they have been able to say they are male, they are under 21, and a host of other issues. But the thing that they all have in common, under 21. So why aren't we raising the age to buy those weapons to 21? Is it gonna guarantee it doesn't happen? No, but is it gonna make us a heck of a lot safer? Yes, it's going to increase the odds in our favor. And I think that's the least that they could do. So as long as they keep showing us who they are, we need to show them, it's our turn to show them who we are and vote them out. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. If we can have each of you all tell us um, where we can find you on online, um, how best to support you during this time, and um, any any other closing remarks, that'd be great. We will start with Roland. Well, thank you all for all for having me. It's really been a pleasure uh, working with you, and hopefully, we're going to work towards a better Texas. Uh, when we get some new people in office, because we need them at the state level for sure. Uh, you're right earlier, we have not been as, uh, we haven't been campaigning so much because we have been in Uvalde quite a bit, uh, trying to resolve some of the management issues and the, the post uh, event issues that you've all been hearing about. And so we'll, we'll be block walking on weekends. You can always find us at rollinfortexas.com. Give us a shout. Uh, you know, of course, your financial help is appreciated. But more than anything, I just want to encourage everybody to I know everybody listening here is going to vote. We've got to go find each one of us has got to find 10, 20, 30 voters that are not going to vote and drag them out there to create change. Because there's just we're living in this space right now in this state that just is it's it's just astounding to me where we are. And um we just we we I, we deserve so much better. Uh, we deserve so much better than what we have, and uh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there with all of your help and all of your efforts, and we appreciate you so very much. Um, Angie, where can we find you, and what help do you need right now with your campaign? So uh, you can find me at Angie for Texas, A-N-G-I, and then for Texas, all written out. That's my website, and that's all of my social. Um, and just a reminder, I'm a mom. I am a first-time candidate, and I'm running because I just got tired of what was happening. And I have to say, I'm so I'm honored to be here with Mothers Against Greg Abbott, and I'm so proud of you for how much you've grown and how much you've accomplished in such a short amount of time. All I did was sign up when I found you, and you've done so amazing things. So I'm really grateful to you doing that. Um, but I would say we all have a role to play in making this change. Roland, Becca, and I are running for office but it's not ours, right? It's we're running for everyone. And we feel the weight of that on our shoulders every single day. And we certainly cannot do it alone. We cannot knock on all the doors we need to knock. We can't make all the phone calls we need to make. And we can't buy ads without contributions. As hard as it is to continuously ask for those contributions, it's critical to get the word out to like-minded people, to educate people about who our opponents are and how dangerous their ideas are and about the good things we we want to accomplish at the state level. So if you can volunteer, if you can contribute, if you can follow us on social, share our messages, get the word out, all of it helps and all of it is a part of getting to where we need to be to, to build a better community for us and our kids. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Um, I have to tell you, I interviewed for um, the independent um, yesterday morning. And when I, when I interviewed for them, or was it this morning? It might've been this morning, actually. My, my days are long. Um, they asked me, 
do mothers get up and worry about their children every single day? And I said, yes, every Absolutely. single day. Mothers across Texas, the only thing they're thinking about is this my last time I'm going to see my child. And uh, she was pretty like, she was just gutted when she heard that. Um, so, so I'm with you and that, that's exactly what I told her. So I'm glad that I wasn't lying, that I conveyed what I felt was true and it is true. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. Becca, you're up next. How can we help you? So I think the most important is one, don't give up hope. Believe in the Texas that you would love to see. Texas that your kids are going to be proud of growing up in because they grew up with personal freedom and surrounded by a community that values and respects them. That's the Texas that Angie and Roland and I are working for. Um, second thing is consider running for office. And I need every woman in this space to understand that you are qualified to run for office. They say on average that it takes 12 times for a woman to accept the ask. And so consider this, if this is your first time hearing it, it's, you know, it counts as one of your asks, okay? So there are not enough of us elected office. And when you think about what we value, education, our kids' safety, our parents' ability to pay for prescription drugs and their property taxes, we value teachers and physicians. We value electricians who, yes, and plumbers who we would love to be licensed, which is something that the legislature tried to take away two years ago. Um, we value those things. We also would love to see things like affordable child care, health care that's accessible for every family. We would love to be able to make the choices about when and how many or if we have kids. Those are all things that we value. Until there are more of us in office, we will never see those things pass. And that is the truth. So please consider running at any level, especially school boards. I know they're scary right now. We need people on that front line to be willing to fight for teachers and our students. So that is my pitch. That is what I really would love all of you to consider for the campaign. You know, we are in the same boat as every other candidate out there. We're looking for funds so that we can make sure that every voter in my district understands that the incumbent made terrible choices for their families last session. We would love to have people block walk. And, you know, honestly, we would love for you to share our socials, but most importantly, please vote and tell your friends to vote and don't give up hope. Okay, thank you. Um, what is your website? Oh, I always forget that. It is Becca, B-E-C-C-A-F-O-R-T-X 121.com. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Becca. And thank you, Angie, for joining me today and joining Mothers Against Greg Abbott. And just, um, I am really rooting for all three of you on the panel tonight. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you all on the campaign trail. And I'm looking forward to, to all of our members who are going to be voting for all three of you. So thank you so much for joining me and you all have a great evening. Take care.